Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. This is your host, Colin Cattell. On the show with us today, happy to have Mr. Sheldon Inwintosh. Industry veterans will know him as the prolific mining financier behind Pine Tree Capital. Uh, Sheldon is a lethal weapon in the space, and I'm happy to call Sheldon a partner on a couple businesses that we've been working on together. His public company, 3D Capital, is a large shareholder in both Palisade Resources and Gold Spot Discoveries. And Palisade Global Investments, also significant shareholders in 3D Capital. Sheldon, welcome on the program. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, this is the first time that I think you've done an interview since the last bull market cycle ended. And hence, there are a lot of questions that I want to address. Uh, let's start with the run-up on, on Pine Tree, which was timed just absolutely perfect with the bottom in the resource sector back in 2000, 2001. I'm certain some analogies can be drawn to today, but let's just start with how the how Pine Tree kind of came together and how you got involved there. Oh, absolutely. I, I founded the company actually in 1992, and our first projects were involved in the biotech space and the technology space. And it wasn't until years later, looking at the macro events, that we sort of morphed into uh, getting involved in resources, which we felt had been through an extended bull market, really triggered more than anything by the whole BRIEX uh, event. And so basically took uh, capital that we had made in the biotech and tech space and started getting involved in, in junior uh, producers and assets that were concrete, not exploratory, but were uh, significantly, in our view, uh, discounted. Now, how did Pine Tree transform from the beginning in 2000, 2001? Uh, when I say beginnings, I mean in the resource sector to uh, what it became at the top, which was a over billion dollar fund, uh, one of the largest, one of the most well known in Canada. What was the transformation like? Well, it sort of just evolved. Um, you know, we, we made some uh, correct choices and investments. Uh, they turned out well, and then we reinvested. Uh, and when I did that, I, I basically was backing a lot of more entrepreneurial uh, type investors because we had actually culled the early fruit of the turnaround in companies like Cambior and Kinross and Eldorado, and then went more into uh, earlier stage uh, where they're, you know, uh, um, a prospector or a, a mining guy, you know, would have a property and some of it was historical resources that had potential. For example, uh, Gold Eagle, which we, uh, you know, put together and and drilled under the lake in in in, in the Bruce Channel Discovery, uh, which was really the extension of the Koshner. Uh, that was a multi-year program that just the joy got better and better. And as success begat one deal, you know, I tended to morph and just spread out and did other deals, and then that just that just snowballed. So at the top, Pine Tree was over a billion dollar market cap, and there were some debt covenants that were put into place. Uh, eventually, there w there was a bit of a demise of Pine Tree, and I want to be uh, fully open and ask you about what happened there, and um, you know just kind of run through the scenario because most people haven't heard the story from your side, and uh, it's quite an interesting story. Well, I don't know how interesting it was. Uh, you know, I would say we were fighting the tape for five years. Um, we had taken a number of positions, and uh, everybody, you know, maybe uh, has has forgotten or wants to forget. But you know, we're seeing the turnaround now from what was a slow decline, not necessarily so material in terms of the commodity commodities, but uh, certainly uh, in terms of, of of the public share prices. And this just kept going at the same time that we were investing, and it became obviously that we weren't having the same frequencies of success uh, just because of the declining interest in the whole space. And it became very volatile. And it got to a point where the debt guys got very nervous and uh, unfortunately foreclosed at the bottom of the market. Uh, it substantially hurt all shareholders. It was a uh, you know, it was not a wise decision for everybody except those who benefited. It benefited, and those it was basically the debenture holders. So that's past history now. 
um, and we're on to uh, a whole new era. So I think it's safe to say, and smartly so, that you've stayed a little bit away from the resource space, at least the last couple of years, uh, which was a time, like you just said, where there was uh, a slowdown in the commodity sector, but the mining sector itself, the resource stocks were hit very hard. I want to draw some comparisons now to how 2000, 2001 looked to what you're seeing right now, because if, uh, if, our, or if our listeners remember from 1996 to 2001, we had a very prolonged bear market in the mining stocks. Seems reminiscent of what we just had from 2011 up until the beginning of last year. What do you think of the comparison there? Well, I think this is, uh, is much different. Um, I, you know, if you looked at that period, gold was still tra- trading in a, in, a, in a channel range and um, really w- never had had the major breakout. From what we've just been through, gold actually hit, and I'm using gold as a barometer, if anything, went to $1,900 or so. So it got ahead of itself probably for many, many reasons. And so when it corrected, which it basically did, you know, 40%, um, as usual, markets tend to exacerbate moves. And what's different is we're coming off a base here that companies can make money. Whereas way back in 96 through that period, gold got down to $280 and maybe Gold Corp with a tie grade could make money. So I think that the base here is is way more solid than it was back then. The balance sheets are way more balance sheets are way more are, are stronger. But what's really interesting in the fundamentals is a lot of the majors now are recognizing that they're going to be running out of ore to mine for their mines. So they are starting to get into land banking and acquiring uh, district scale projects to find large. Uh, new discoveries to 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 basically be be their part of their pipeline for going forward, and they're very concerned about that. So I believe that this cycle is much different than then, and that's why the rebound has been more robust. Today, you're working on a company called 3D Capital that's listed on the CSE exchange under the ticker symbol IDK. And I've heard a couple of people refer to it as Pine Tree 2.0, the reference obviously being that this is your deal and you're using uh, uh, 3D Capital to support and incubate uh, certain deals. I want to get an understanding directly from you what the goals are this time around and uh, what you're hoping to achieve with 3D. Well, uh, you know, the goals are always to make shareholders money. It's never changed. Uh, probably the difference in style this time around will be, for example, uh, the collaboration that Palisades has, Palisades Global does have with IDK. And that is that we have two companies that um, were originally one, as you know, we split them separately because they each have massive promise and they're different uh, business models in that, you know, IDK uh, if you will, owns 28, 25% of these companies approximately and is involved in helping to build them as we have a geologist and Ian House here. Uh, we're constantly looking. We're, we're more hands-on as almost like an operator. And the investments that we will make outside of those type of models will be companies that we know very well. We're part of management. We're extremely close. And, you know, I think it's going to be less of a shotgun. The, the previous uh, uh, philosophy was, I believed, uh, and I was wrong, on the timing of the move of gold. I mean, I'm still convinced it's going to do the things I thought, but uh, as we all and many others before me have underestimated, uh, you know, how long it takes and timing's everything. And, and uh, that, that hurt because the model was to be involved in as many um, situations as possible because you never know and as it turned out looking back on all those companies we owned you know it would be worth way over a billion dollars today so I know I wasn't wrong but it was really the timing thing this time around um, I think probably what I'll do is uh, less delegation uh, you know to people that really were not as qualified as they might have been to make the decisions they did uh, and to be more hands-on in the projects that we're doing. So it's not going to be any uh, widespread um, uh, machine gun approach. It's going to be a much more rifle shot approach. And just to provide some more backstory, you mentioned the two companies that 
3D Capital had founded together with Palisade Global Investments. We had the fortune of getting linked up uh, about a year and a half ago, and we formed Palisade Resources together between 3D Capital and Palisade Global Investments. And Palisade Resources has gone on to acquire and stake about 30 projects, many of them being district-sized plays. I think it's worth talking a little bit more about what Palisade Resources is doing. Uh, because you mentioned the focus for the majors right now on replacing ounces. That's something that's just starting out. And if we're right that gold prices uh, increase, that's only going to accelerate more. No, that's correct. And really, I think what we are doing is uh, our collaboration uh, with our networks, which are very complementary, is that we're getting access to not grassroots properties from the sunset uh, that that no one knows what's there but we've been very opportunistic in going out before others and grabbing ground and creating our own theories like Newfoundland where if we're not the largest landholder we're the second largest by a hair and uh, we believe that that is a a totally um, unworked uh, jurisdiction and because no mining could be done prior to 1980 so we've been able to acquire district scale as you say uh, projects and uh, footprints. So um, it's it's a private company now, and you know, as you know, we've raised capital. We're going to move things along. Um, if we had to do comparables out there, I'd almost use the company of Cisco. Obviously, they're bigger. They have a bigger team. They have no producing mines. But if you look at our property portfolio, and we uh, get lucky, or you know, we use our our smarts to get lucky. Um, we feel that the leverage is is going to be pretty significant. So rather than just going out and buying juniors that have properties, we're buying properties that we own 100% of um, inside uh, inside Palisades. Uh, we're big we're big players in Nevada. I mentioned Newfoundland, Ontario, basically right in the uh, Kirkland Lake uh, Osisco backyard um, that we know that other companies are now coming in and recognizing the potential, geological potential, and they surround us everywhere. So we know that, you know, we're well positioned, you know, for for advancing uh, these projects and again, perhaps making a major discovery. To continue on that storyline, there was a challenge called the Integra Gold Challenge back last March, not at this last PDAC, but about 14 months ago at the previous PDAC. And our president of Palisade Resources, Denny Laviolette, had spotted the second place runner up group called the Data Miners, which had used artificial intelligence on Integra's Lamac deposit to try and find new gold zones. And the idea was hatched of what if we could use this on a regional scale? Uh, you're, you're a huge technology. Uh, investor Sheldon and you saw the potential here that artificial intelligence is really just starting to break out and find its way around things and nobody had really quite applied it to the mining sector and so uh, once again just to fill investor uh, listeners in on what uh, we were discussing there gold spot is a uh, a separate company but it was born out of Palisade resources and I'd be interested to hear what you think about gold spot well I, I how I feel, and you're right, I've had my foot in both the mining arena and the technology arena, and AI is not a new just a new thought. There's nothing, uh, we're not discovering AI. AI is, is discovering the world in the sense that technology today allows for a- high-speed analytics of high, uh, high concentrated, uh, huge amounts of data. And I sort of look at companies today that If they're not using AI, I realize that it's the old school of the geologist not wanting to use any tool other than, you know, his own confidence and non-invented hair syndrome. So I met with actually a a major company today and uh, talking about AI and saying that it's it's in terms of of time to find something as well as the finding costs will reduce are going to is going to be reduced by an order of magnitude by analyzing all the available data that's public and all the avail- available data that one can acquire that, that, that might be somewhat proprietary and go through a rigorous analysis to determine where they're going to drill and save a lot of the um, you know iterative processes that take a lot of time, a lot of money, often a project's mid-ter- midterm in its, in its discovery 
and you know there's a there's a downturn in the space or in gold or the sentiment and then no one touches it again for 10 years so we are going to be able to speed up the whole process and give companies a tool that is not going to is going to be accretive to whatever their their business is so my view is if you're not using ai in today's exploration world or even exploration and uh, development exploration i .e. you you've got maybe a discovery or you've got a mine that you're producing but it's running out of ore and you need to expand it you know the no one's been able to develop the x-ray machine to go underground and figure out where these things go it's, very, it's much more difficult business than uh, say oil and gas where you have seismic that that really is a great tool so um, to me this is this is a holy grail no-brainer uh, we believe that from what we've seen out there, that at this stage, we're, we're ahead of the pack. Uh, what that means is, is a bit subjective at this point, because we have to do proof of concepts to show people that we can take a data package. We've done it for ourselves in the province of Quebec. We've proven that we believe it can work. Now we want to show other companies. And once we establish some type of connection between the work that we do and and how we advise these companies upon where they where they should drill, we think that we will, upon success, have one of the most robust business models for the junior mining arena. As well as we have used that tool internally, as uh, Colin would know. Say in the province of Quebec, we have gone through using uh, Palisades resources and staked uh, on a regional basis high quality property targets, the very few that were left, because it's a very, um, uh, it's a, it's a very staked province, if you will, because there's 82 mines. Um, and we uh, were able to find some jewels that uh, we think uh, give us an edge, ultimately, uh, because we've been able to narrow down the properties that we think have merit and future. So I'm extremely bullish on it. It's early days for us. Um, we're, we're, we're sort of doing a lot of work internally. We've just added two senior members to our team uh, that a modeling PhD. These are all, we had six PhDs that we backed uh, to develop this. And now we're just expanding more industry veterans who have done an aspect of the AI uh, challenge that we're doing. So we're more rounded um, and we look forward to a really disruptive approach to the mining industry. Wrapping this all back together, uh, for our listeners, Palisade Resources and Goldspot are both uh, significantly owned by Sheldon's company, 3D Capital. And so I've had a lot of people ask how they can get involved or get participation in these private companies. They are private at this point. Maybe at some point we'll go public. Uh, 3D Capital is a, is a proxy for both these companies and uh, certainly something to look at. Sheldon, some other really, really fantastic news uh, that came out uh, just today, Wednesday, April 5th, was uh, Northern Sphere Mining, a company that you're the chairman of, uh, has just announced a financing, and I understand Eric Sprott is going to be a participant. Uh, a good friend of yours, Eric, is going to be a participant in Northern Sphere. Do you mind talking a little bit about that company? No, we're uh, you know we're very excited. It's also um, owned by IDK. 3D Capital has an investment in it, and we'll be investing more in this round. Uh, we've been working with Eric's group for about five months. Uh, we've walked the property. Greg Gibson's been up. We have, we have over five miles of, of, uh, of high-grade silver veining. There's five old shafts. Um, and the property just needed to, uh, we needed to acquire equipment. We needed to uh, get some good technical, a technical team. We have uh, senior people from the Kirkland Lake camp now running it. We, we've got equipment. We've got obviously now financial backing. It's not a high cost operation, but it's very similar to Hecla, where you can you can mine forever. Uh, you don't produce a 43-101, but you produce money. And so uh, this was an old mine that had been mined and then stopped for all the reasons that they do in Arizona. Uh, and what's interesting is on the property, there is a very high probable porphyry target that is, uh, our property is very close to Freeport and to a, a number of other major uh, copper gold producers. 
uh, where it's a it's large scale tonnage um, in in gold and gold and copper, and they feel we've been approached that we have the best target outside their mines. So we're we're going to approach that. And then third is in Canada, uh, we have the old Scadding mine. We have a massive property in Sudbury. Uh, average grade of our of our reserve is 10 grams. It's open up in every direction. So this just needed um, kind of an infusion of the right people, uh, the capital, of course, to attack all these you know assets that are there. And um, we're going to be supported by uh, uh, Sprott Mining's technical team and people uh, to help us. Uh, so we're we're actually going to lever off the you know 50 or 60 projects that they have experience in with the people, with equipment, and so forth. So. We're very pleased uh, that uh, that they decided to become the lead and and basically took the whole financing, um, but we we're we're increasing it because we just want a bit more of a cushion. So they're excited, we're excited. Uh, it'll be good for IDK and it'll be good for everybody associated with uh, Northern Sphere. Sheldon, a major theme on Palisade Radio for the, f- the past few months uh, has been uranium. And in fact, under the moniker of Palisade Resources, uranium has been a secondary or maybe tertiary focus commodity-wise in that we have a, a portfolio of assets in the Athabasca Basin that we've worked together to amass. You were one of the first investors in the uranium space. Nobody really even had uh, uranium in their portfolio before 2000, 2001. And I remember just thinking back that, you know, you put mega uranium together. You had a lot of investments in the space. What's your thoughts on it now? A lot of people want to know where it's headed. Well, I think uranium is like a super tanker. It it moves uh, as slow as it takes to build um, a, uh, uh, a, a generating plant. And on paper, uranium to me looks like it has a great future. And I used to speak on the subject, but the problems are many and the time uh, points are many. I don't think you're going to see a substantial change in the spot price of uranium till most likely the end of 18. And it's really the world is changing in terms of substitute uh, forms of energy and uh, I believe that it's 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 a very long cycle. Uh, it's fine to be involved in the discovery side, um, and we did that with NextGen, the largest discovery on the planet. Um, but when you'll be able to actually monetize in a way that you feel maximizes value is unknown. So um, probably a great time to position for the next cycle, if you will, but. Um, the number of people that, I mean, I think suffered in the last cycle because you had a price spike, you had issues in Australia that, that forced that, and you know, whether it be Olympic Dam and other issues where they had to cover uh, short contracts. And uh, it is just an area that is very, very hard to predict. The timeline to building and approvals is very long. So uh, I no longer look at it as a business I want to be in long term. I don't mind the short term aspect of discovery because that's always interests me. But I think that I don't think there's short term miracles that are going to come uh, in, in, in the uranium space. Well, let's end on this note for the thousands of Palisade radio listeners out there. And in light of your thoughts on where we are in the cycle right now, what would you say to people asking how to place their resource-focused money through the rest of 2017 and into 2018? I think a, uh, an obvious one is maybe look at 3D Capital and putting some money there. But uh, what do you what do you think is the place to be uh, for the next couple of years? Well, I believe that the market uh, has, has still been high-graded in terms of the companies that have done well. And I think if you do your homework, there are a lot of undiscovered names that have quality assets. Maybe the management team's not all together or they're underfunded. If you want to play the early end of the game, I think there's many, many great opportunities and I would look for those. Some companies where a lot of the money's going into, I think, have, have, have exceeded their, their really short-term values because it's just more money chasing fewer deals. 
But I'm, I'm very optimistic on the precious metal side, extremely so. And if we look at, for example, Northern Sphere, where we're doing this financing at a, you know, a pre-market value of, of $8 million, uh, we're one of those companies that just had to go through a few hoops before we could pull it all together. But if we can stockpile what we think we can on a quarterly basis of silver and silver uh, core, um, uh, processed ore, I'm sorry, uh, you know, th the returns are substantial. So I think there's companies like that and others where the best moves are yet to come, but it's caveat emptor. And I think people have to listen to groups like yours who vet these companies uh, because you know, you got to be very careful what you invest in out there. Sheldon, I do appreciate you taking the time to come speak to our listeners on Palisade Radio today. Uh, the partnership we've formed has been fantastic so far, and uh, we'll continue to build some value there. So uh, any uh, listeners who have any questions, feel free to send, send me an email. Uh, Sheldon is truly back in the space here, and hopefully we can get you back on uh, in, the, in the months ahead to discuss where we are in the market and discuss how your deals are advancing. Thanks, Colin. Think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people? Hit the bid. How violent that term could be? It actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen? Are you too stupid?